So I've got a question here from Saved by Grace, and this was uh, in the comments section under our post, Covenant Theology and Dispensationalism. And before we even get to that, Saved by Grace, that is a great, great name. That is uh, a truer statement has never been uttered. Um, But here's the question. When you say that we haven't hit the starting point for Jesus' second coming, are you assuming a gap for the 70 weeks of years? And if so, where do I find in the Bible that there is a gap? It's a good question. Um, So... Uh, Let me cover a couple things here that are implied in the question for those who may not be aware. Uh, The 70 weeks of years that are being referred to is, uh, and you can turn here to Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. This is what is known as Daniel's 70-week prophecy. It is a prophecy that was given to Daniel by the angel where he is told about a series of events that will take place in a certain time frame of 70 weeks And the the word for weeks there is a term that basically can be used like we would typically in English use the word decade. A decade means 10 years. Well, the word shabuim there in the Hebrew uh, is a term that speaks of a week of years. And so there are 70 weeks of years in view, or if you just add that up, 490 years. Um, The passage is broken up into a couple of sections here that, um, that are... Uh, that seem to be implied by the way that the weeks are divided uh, and cutoff points, which I'll I'll read the passage and you'll see it for yourself. Um, But let me also uh, mention something else before we dive into the passage, because I'll I'll explain it as we go. But there's also, we mentioned uh, in, uh, I believe in that post, uh, as well as a few others along the way, that Daniel, in this prophecy, um, actually gives the exact date of Christ's first coming, and also in this passage, we, we, we discover that Daniel actually gives the exact day of Christ's second coming. Both of those predictions are, are, um, uh, are based upon the starting point that is given for each of those events. Uh, the first coming has a starting point that is given in the passage, and the second coming of Christ also is, is um, uh, uh, the starting point for that countdown is given in this passage as well. Let me sh- explain what I mean as we go through. Um, so, starting in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. There, again, is the 70 weeks. 70 shabuim, or 70 periods of seven years, are determined for your people and for your holy city. We see the scope. Uh, It is determined for your people, the Jews, and your holy city, Jerusalem. Daniel is a Jew. His holy city is Jerusalem. The scope of the prophecy is given. This is the focus, Israel and Jerusalem, okay? Uh, The people of Israel and and the city of Jerusalem. And a number of things are given within that time frame that uh, they're given that time to accomplish these things. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Now, here you go. From the going forth of this command... This would have happened on March 14th in, in 445 BC, uh, and, uh, and, and when that command was given to rebuild, as it says here, to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, not just the temple, but Jerusalem itself, from that point, there would be, uh, as he says here, uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 69 in total, right, or in years, 483 years, um, until Messiah comes. Then the, uh, the street shall be built and the wall in trouble, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of breaking down a lot here. I'm doing it relatively quickly. This is a, 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 a wonderful passage that certainly deserves more than the time we'll give it today. But just notice what's in view here. Um, there is mention of the 69 weeks, or as it's described, the 7 and the 62. Add them together, you get 69. Why there's a break in between the 7 and 62, there are various speculations as to why that is. But combined, for our purpose, from the point that that command is given to re- rebuild and restore Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, or it comes, uh, is 69 of those weeks, or 483 years. Now, this takes place, uh, uh, literally, when Christ comes into uh, Jerusalem on April 6th in 32 AD, 
literally 173,880 days or exactly 430 years to the day between the, the giving of that command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem until the arrival of Messiah the Prince. This, by the way, adds extreme heft to what Jesus is talking about in, in, um, uh, in Luke uh, 19 when he stands there on the cusp of entering Jerusalem and he, he speaks about how Jerusalem is going to be brought down um, um, and he's weeping over the city. And the reason he gives as to why this day will come when Jerusalem will be, will be sacked is because they did not recognize this their day. Sometimes when you read that just sort of casually, uh, we just assume it just basically means they didn't recognize Messiah when he came. But when you realize Daniel's prophecy and the specificity of it, Daniel gives a very specific prophecy. Jesus was talking about the very day he would ride into Jerusalem. Uh, They had often tried to make him king, but he wouldn't let them. However, this very day that he would enter in, um, he would enter in, present himself as Messiah, on exactly this, their day, the day when they should have been waiting for Messiah to arrive. They literally could have been standing at the gates waiting for him to come over the horizon. Uh, The scribes and Pharisees did not want to believe it was Jesus, but whether they thought it was or not, they should have been looking for somebody to come across the threshold and present himself as Messiah uh, in the style as as presented by Zechariah, where he'd ride in on a donkey on the fold, the colt of a donkey, Um, The people, as Jesus came in, were throwing down their clothes and palm branches and crying out Hosanna and all this kind of thing. Matter of fact, we just read about the triumphal entry in our uh, reading in Mark in chapters 10 and 11. Um, So this day was not just sort of, hey, this is the time when Messiah shows up. No, it was the exact day that Jesus would come. So the first two verses of this, uh, or the first three verses of Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 24 through 26, uh, the first three verses of this four-verse prophecy. The first three deal with Christ's first coming, and interestingly, the subsequent destruction that Jesus spoke about. Notice verse 26. Um, after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So, not after 62 weeks, but after the 62 weeks. In other words, the one previously mentioned in verse 25, following the initial seven. In other words, at the end of the 69 weeks. Jesus will come, he'll arrive, and during his time here, he will be cut off, okay? Uh, In other words, killed. And it is generally understood that what is being said here, he's going to be killed, but not for himself, okay? As it says, cut off or killed, but not for himself. Uh, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war, desolations are determined." It's a very telling thing, and this now begins to move us into the answer to the question that Saved by Grace asked. Um, So, after he's cut off, again, they reject him as their Messiah. Um, I always want to make sure I include in this, by the way. We don't hate the Jews because they rejected their Messiah. Jesus didn't go to the cross just because the Jews rejected him. Jesus went to the cross because of all of our sin. Okay, and so if if we want to know who ultimately is responsible for Jesus dying, we can look in the mirror and we can see that we're responsible for that. Ultimately, we are responsible. So, but anyway, coming back to the text, um, the city is destroyed in the sanctuary following Jesus' death. Jesus spoke about that again in Luke chapter 19 when he talked about how the people, uh, when he basically refers to this people of the prince who come destroying them, and they ultimately are dispersed. Like a flood, they are literally washed out of Jerusalem. The diaspora takes place in 70 AD when the Jews are essentially thrust out of uh, of the area um, under Titus Vespasian when he comes with his two Roman legions and, and, and destroys the city, the sanctuary, and all this kind of thing. It's terrible. And it goes on to say at the end of verse 26, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So the city is desolate. The diaspora takes place. The Jews are no longer in their homeland. Verse 27, then he shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. Now again, much could be said about this passage, but notice what's happening here, even in this passage in Daniel. There is a destroying of the temple and of the city. There is a driving out of the people. But yet, all of a sudden, a covenant is signed between somebody and the nations, or the many. Now, we know that Israel is in view in that uh, at least one of the many who are involved is Israel. We know this because verse 24 tells us that this whole prophecy has as its focus 
Israel and Jerusalem, the people of Israel and Jerusalem. And on top of that, in verse 27, there is mention of the end of sacrifices and offerings in the middle of that last 70th week. Verse 27 deals with the 70th week of Daniel, and in the middle of that week, sacrifices and offerings cease. How can sacrifices and offerings cease if there's no temple? The implication is is that there will be a temple, which tells us that the 70th week takes place during the period of time when there is a temple, when the offerings and sacrifices can cease. Um, Titus Vespasian never signed a covenant when he wiped out the city and all that kind of thing. The, uh, the, and, and by the way, at this point, I need to introduce a lot of other elements that are, or at least some other elements, that are uh, extant during the time of Daniel's 70th week. Uh, Jesus himself, for example, mentions, uh, references this, as well as a couple of other places where the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation in particular are mentioned. But Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 talks about, and, and after these days, but yet prior to 70 AD during his own ministry, he, in his Olivet Discourse, in the midst of it, describes how when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, flee. Don't go back on the, you know, in your house to get your stuff. Just pray it's not on the Sabbath, all this kind of stuff. Run, flee when you see this happen. Again, very, very Israel-centric, right? Gentiles wouldn't really care about things happening on the Sabbath and all that. And, and plus the idea of the abomination of desolation is a very Jewish thing. They, they know exactly what he's talking about when he says this. He's referring to Daniel and he says so. Well, in 70 AD, um, we didn't see an abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. We saw Romans attacking the city and all that, but the temple was destroyed. There was no image set up. There was no abomination of desolation. Uh, Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 makes reference to this as well, uh, also prior to 70 AD, um, when he talks about the Antichrist going into the holy, uh, uh, into the temple, declaring himself to be God, demanding to be worshipped above all that is called God. John, uh, Revelation chapter 13, written by John, uh, references the idea of this image, which we presume to be the abomination of desolation, both Jesus, Daniel, and Paul, uh, likely were, well, no, I wouldn't say likely, I would say certainly were, were thinking of when they were talking about their apocalyptic uh, passages they, they shared. And so there is there are a lot of events that take place in the 70th week. How do we know that the 70th week is, there's a gap between the 69th and 70th week? I would simply say that because we know of the certainty of what happened in the first 69 weeks, we should also expect the 70th week to be fulfilled in similar literal fashion. Well, those things haven't happened yet. Now, interestingly, from a, from a larger theological framework, uh, Paul spends a lot of time talking about in places like Romans um, that there is a period of time that the Gentiles are the focus. Uh, one hint of this is in Romans chapter 11, verses 25, 20, 25, 26, where he speaks about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in, after which point God once again uh, returns and demonstrates his faithfulness to Israel by not forsaking them, but once again, uh, we'll see that he'll work through them. That's a hint there in Romans, but it fits well into the overall theology of God's promises to Israel, his working through Israel. However, as we see both again in Daniel, I would say it's implied but also when we understand the larger theology of, or eschatology, uh, scripturally speaking, we understand that we're living in that gap right now where God is working through the Gentiles. When he once again, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and he once again turns his attention to Israel, he will fulfill all of the promises that he has made to her. Uh, promises which we have spoken of uh, many, many, many times previously. Things like the promise to both Abraham's descendants, nationally and ethnically, but also to the land of Israel itself. Again, Genesis 12, 15, 17, and so forth. Um, the promises that he made to his people to restore them, to bring them back and make them one stick once again, coming back in Ezekiel 36 and 37. We see that they're brought back into the land. Um, the, uh, the northern ten tribes seem to go off into oblivion uh, after the Assyrians uh, ultimately take them captive, and, and they're sort of absorbed. However, they do come back in the end. They are restored uh, once again. Matter of fact, the Levitical tribe uh, becomes uh, prominent because the priesthood once again becomes active in a, uh, in a rebuilt uh, Jewish temple where all these things take place. And so there's a lot of things throughout Scripture. There's not a verse that says, per se, you know, to answer your question directly, there's not a verse that says, okay, here there's a gap between the 69th and 70th week. But it is strongly implied by virtue of the things I've just described. 
So that being said, um, since we know that there was, again, some very, very epic specificity about Christ's first coming uh, and, uh, and what would happen in terms of his being cut off and, and uh, the destruction of the city and the temple and all these things, we should therefore assume that the, the verse 27 and the events it describes will happen literally especially when we see those things explained in greater detail in the New Testament. Um, so this is, um, this is how we arrive at that. And uh, I would say that if we don't see that gap here, that actually creates a whole lot more problems than it solves um, in regard to understanding eschatology. Uh, it forces us to have to take things in very subjective fashion uh, or allegorical fashion, which again is subject to a lot of subjectivity in its interpretation, when uh, I would, um, and just to lay my bias on the table here, my bias is to take the scripture at face value first. And when you do that, the things I've explained fit very, very nicely into an overall plan. And so, um, so that being said, hopefully that helps answer the question. That was probably the quickest I've ever been able to explain it, but hopefully I didn't just rush through and, and leave anything important out. Um, but hopefully that gives you something to think about and maybe answers the question, or maybe, um, you know, if not, then uh, if there's any other particulars, please feel free to share it in the comments section, or you can always email at info at So um, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for um, uh, participating and sharing your thoughts and questions. And uh, until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace forever. Father, we thank you for your plans and purposes that are being fulfilled and have been uh, underway uh, for so long and will one day find their ultimate consummation when Jesus returns and establishes that kingdom. After the Antichrist comes on the scene and uh, after the false prophet establishes this abomination of desolation, after these things that Daniel speaks about and so many others in the Old Testament speak about are fulfilled, ultimately we see the coming of that millennial promise, the promise of that kingdom which um, floods the Old Testament is just uh, re- evident in so many passages we see coming to fruition uh, one day in, in Revelation 19 and 20. And so we so look forward to Christ coming and ruling and reigning where righteousness will reign and there will be a kingdom that lasts forever. No longer will men dominate and destroy this world, but ultimately Jesus will come and establish his kingdom. And he will fulfill that which he's invited us to pray uh, in asking for the kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Father. We love you and praise you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.